Still photographs were familiar to our Victorian forebears, and by the 1920s, cinema was a popular form of entertainment. Radio took off soon afterwards. The next step was to try and bring the two together, send moving pictures over the airways. But how was this to be done? Answering that question would lead to the invention of television. By the 1930s, there had been over 50 serious proposals for television. The competition was international, with inventors working in 11 different countries. From the start, ideas for how television would work broadly fitted into two camps, mechanical techniques and electronic techniques. It was a race that could have only one winner. Mechanical television was first out of the blocks, thanks to an obsessive Scottish engineer, John Logie Baird. Baird had been a prolific, largely unsuccessful inventor since childhood. But it was here in Hastings that he had the idea that would change his life. Why not convert pictures into signals and send them through the air? Baird actually didn't invent any of the component parts that went together to make television. But his strength lay in the fact, as an inventor, that he could look at these disparate inventions and pluck together the bits that he needed to get what he wanted. Baird created his first prototype using a combination of recycled parts and four key inventions from other people. So this is what he started with. He got a hat box, cut some holes in it, made it spin to scan the image. The thing he made it spin with was this, a adapted fan engine. And then he wanted to focus the image, so he used the lens from a bicycle lamp. Next, he takes that image and he passes it through this. Now, this is a selenium cell which he got from a local army surplus store, and that creates an electrical signal. Electrical signal goes into this, which he also bought from an army surplus store. This is an amplifier, and that creates a bigger signal, which then passes into this, a neon lamp, which kind of glows depending on the signal it gets. And that, in turn, is projected through another spinning disc. He mounts this whole ramshackle device onto what's called a coffin board, which was actually used by local undertakers to carry dead bodies on. Despite appearances, this homespun equipment was about to make history. Hi there. Hi. Good to meet you. So I've got this idea that he's got all these funny little bits of apparatus. Did it really work? Originally, he could show just basically a black cross. It's a bit flickery and a bit wobbly. And he could just about, with some special focusing, just about get a white blob of a face with a blob for each of the eyes and a third blob for the mouth. And he said if the person spoke, you could just see the bottom blob wiggling a little bit. But he knew this is going to work. But as a lone inventor, Baird needed support. He placed an advert in The Times and later met businessman Wilfred Day who sent him funds and equipment. He rented a studio in this Hastings Arcade and threw himself into achieving that elusive, clear picture. On one occasion, he actually blows himself up. He's joining all these batteries up, not a good idea. He gets a 1200 volt shock and he's found with burns on the other side of the lab. And the landlord here, not very happy and uh, eventually tells Baird he's got to go. So in 1924, Baird moved to London and set up a lab in an attic studio in Soho. He was using better amplifiers, better valves. He was putting more light on the subject. In fact, he was putting so much light on the subject that he actually set fire to someone's hair. And after that, no one would sit in front of his camera. So he bought an old ventriloquist dummy's head, which he called Stucky Bill and Stucky Bill would sit under these very hot, bright lights for hours on end without complaining. But finally, after months of frustration, his hard work paid off. On the 2nd of October, 1925, he finally managed to get the image of Stucky Bill transmitted across the room. It was blurry, it was out of focus, but it was a recognizable face. <laughs> 